and I was never able to ask him for permission for something that I did. What I did, I wrote a book. And in the book, there's a picture of me, and it was Bob, who was on the board of Broadcast Pioneers with me, who took that picture. And I called Bob for months and months, asking, Bob, may I use the picture in my book? I called, and Bob never returned the phone call. And the reason is he was too ill to get back to me. So this is a, this is a memory of Bob Kravitz. Broadcast pioneers member Bob Kravitz began playing the violin at age four. In first grade, he became one of the youngest concert masters of the Philadelphia Public School System. Bob's career began in 1963 with the Old Evening and Sunday Bulletin. As a student at Philadelphia's only high school, he worked in the features department, scheduling for the daily comics. He also helped research a column called Channel Chat with Rex Pollier and Frank Brookhouser. In 1967, Bob was hired as a sound technician by what is now WPBI-TV Action News. Back then, he was a freshman at Temple University. The best photographers in the city taught him editing and photojournalism. By 21, he became the youngest photojournalist on the streets of Philadelphia. Such was the beginning of a 43-year career conveying to viewers on the ground and in the air what Bob was seeing through the lens of his camera. As a news photographer, Bob saw the best and worst of the human condition. He traveled all over the world and was the recipient of numerous awards. He focused his lens on a king, a queen, heroes, and killers. He conveyed the Gulf War in 1991 and the Moog family tragedies. Bob was the aerial photojournalist for CBS3, NBC 10, and Fox 29 in the last 10 years of his career. In 1972, he and Susan Block were married, married for nearly 47 years. Where's Susan? To some, Bob was known as the singing cameraman. Singing and acting came as natural to him as walking and chewing gum. He had been performing since age six. Bob starred in productions of Finian's Rainbow, West Side Story, and Music Man. Tevia in Fiddler on the Roof was his signature role. He also sang opera, performing in productions of La Traviata, Madame Butterfly, and Carmen. He wrote and performed three cabaret shows, Opera Broadway Review, Al Jolson Review, and Tevye from Anatevka. Bob performed on the stage, the stages of the Academy of Music, Schubert Theater, Academy of Vocal Arts, Merriam Theater, Sheltonham Playhouse, and the Society Hill Playhouse. He sang the national anthem for the Freedom Medal Ceremony at the July 4th ceremony, celebration in Philadelphia and at immigration stirring in ceremonies. Bob shared on the boards of three board companies, three, three board organizations, the Board of Young Variety, the Board of Directors for Broadcast Pioneer, and the Broadcast and the Kennedy House. He became the first photojournalist to be inducted into Sigma Delta Chi, the prestigious Writers Society. Bob also became a standardized patient for Hahnemann University Hospital and College of 
osteopathic medicine. That's when his well-owned abilities as an actor helped doctors develop diagnostic techniques. He was a master of faking illness. Bob also worked with the Cancer Hope Network, helping people around the world cope with bladder and prostate cancer. Some years ago, he underwent surgery for these conditions. He came to understand people need support in dealing with the aftermath that we need uh, when, and to know that life goes on despite one's illness and one's limitations should not by be defined by one's illness. He was inducted into the Broadcast Hall of Fame in 2016. Bob died on July 30th. In addition to his wife, Susan, he is survived by two brothers, Ronald and Philip, and many nieces and nephews. So that's our tribute to Bob. Please sing with me. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we held at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight. Somebody that Bob grew up with. 
uh, my instructor, who was our embassy, uh, Bob and I lived in the same neighborhood in Overbrook Park, Park for a while. But that's long after where these guys grew up. My Kamana. And by the way, on our YouTube website, Mike does a fabulous interview with Bob. It's 39 minutes long, it's video. And you can go and watch it anytime. And we have a couple of excerpts that we're going to be playing for you. Mike? 39 minutes is uh, a phone call from Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> I think I got selected because I perhaps know Bobby and Walt as anybody in the room, with a possible exception of Steve Lee. I don't know, but you may have been a little younger. We all grew up in Logan. Steve and Bobby and I, and that's why they call him Bobby, by the way. It says Bobby out there, but it was Bobby Travis. Uh, and so we, we grew up hanging out in Bernie's schoolyard, Taper Field, Cutting Park, and, and we were. We were all buddies, uh, so much so that, oh, let me point out, I'm slightly older than they are, and <laughs> full disclosure, five or six years. So we didn't play together necessarily. So if I was 14, I was playing basketball with an eight or nine year old, but we knew each other. So much so that the day Bobby walked into the newsroom at Channel, at channel 6, interestingly, it's a scam likely, and it lives in my heritage. <laughs> that will turn out. Anyway, uh, so he walks into the newsroom, and I've already been working there. I'm sitting at my desk, and he quoted, he remembered the story. I didn't. He said, I looked up from my desk, and there he was. I said, what the hell are you doing here? So we were talking to Logan. What he was doing was beginning the career that Ed just described, the career that included uh, his, his, we now call him photojournalist, as a shooter, as a sound man, uh, and as a singer and entertainer and a terrific guy. Uh, we are here today remembering him, but rather than remember, I would think we want to celebrate. He was truly special. And Susan and I were talking about that. He was simply a special guy you want to celebrate. We were very, very fortunate uh, to know him. So he did all those good things. But what I remember was his ability to deal with life's afflictions, life's problems, uh, life's health issues. We've all been through those and that we've discussed here today. We're all going through them now more frequently. We all talk about that sort of thing. Uh, we don't have a teleprompter, so I have a list of ailments um, that, that Bobby went through. I don't know that I can survive it. It is, he is a role model for how you address that. Uh, we start off with one that everybody knows, and that was the helicopter crash. Wow. It's the uh, late 90s. He's on the helicopter. I think it's the Channel 6 helicopter. Uh, takes off uh, from the heliport down on the river. Doesn't quite make it. Crashes down. He's okay. I think we have something from that. It's funny. You don't think of that. You get in your seat. You fly. Well, one morning we're taking off. We go about a story high, and bells and whistles start going, and something happened. And that means we're, something's going on, figuring we could land, but not really. It started shaking, and as we came down, we hit the dolly we took off from, it tipped over, and literally, as it was coming down, it felt like a long, long time. It was only probably about 10 seconds. I wasn't high, thank God, where it would be. But 10 seconds, and I did see my life in front of me. I mean, you just think of everything. Right? I had a Paul. Cut my, because my uh, seatbelt was stuck. Uh, it was locked, it wouldn't open. So he cut me out of there and they lifted me out. I hurt my neck and my back. I said I wanted to go back and the only one really crying and was upset about it was Susan, my wife. But she realizes it, flying and taking pictures, it's something that you can't understand. It's, it's a great thrill. I guess it's being dangerous again. I don't know. I mean, I love being in that helicopter. Well, yeah, pretty exciting flying in a helicopter. We used to use it for transportation to go from one scene to another. Um, and while it looks as if he, he escaped that without injury, Susan was telling me within a year or two, and both hips were placed as a result of that helicopter crash. Mark that as number one. Uh, so he's doing okay, and then a few years later, he has a bladder problem. 
actually been diagnosed with cancer, or it was or not, but in any event, they eventually removed his bladder, and for the rest of his life, he walked around with a bag attached to him, a gyroscopy bag. I don't know about you guys, but that doesn't sound like fun, but you would never know that. I don't think Bobby ever said, gee, I got this bag, what a pain in the ass to have to live with this thing. He never complained. That's what I found so remarkable, so admirable. He is that role model. So, so then we are going along with the bag, and um, again, check. We don't have a telephone. We start to check uh, Next thing was cardiac, you know, mitral valve problem. Uh, it took care of that by putting in a mechanical valve. So he's okay, except he needed stents a little while after that. And he's okay, except he needed a pacemaker a little bit while after that. So we're now okay. Another series of incidents, all of which would, let, would leave me curled up in a, in a fetal position. And Bobby just went on about his life. All the things that you, that, that Ed was talking about, all the things he did, came after this or after this. So it never, never seemed to bother him. Uh, moving on, more recently, in the last few, I guess, uh, last year and a half or so, he had a brain bleed. Uh, and they had to move part of the skull, in fact. Steve and Frank Olsen and I went to visit him uh, at his place uh, while he was recovering from this. And he was wearing a helmet, and, and maybe we talked about it for a few minutes, but it was never the focus. All these things that I would entertain with you or you with, with about my illnesses, my illness, he never brought up. It was as if none of this seemed to affect him. Um, and then at some point after that, after I was talking to him on the phone. Uh, and we were talking about something. Oh, I know he was, he was pissed because Hahnemann was going out of business and he wanted the surgery to replace the skull and they got Hahnemann. So we were talking about that. And then in the middle of the conversation, as if it, it was meaningless, oh, by the way, I'm in the hospital, they have to replace my pacemaker. They have to replace some kind of microchip. He never, ever complained about all these things that you and I, or I don't know about you, that I would say, hey, wait a second, my whole world is screwed up as a result of this. Bobby's world never seemed to be screwed up. And that was followed by some infections, seizures, and his passing. I want to say this, as, as courageous as he was in going through all of this, his ability to deal with those things, uh, I find remarkable. I would be, uh, I would be making a mistake if, if I did not credit in some way Susan. While we never heard any of those complaints, I suspect at night he came home and started talking about those things. And I, I'm going to say that I suspect that much of his strength came from Susan as well. Uh, he is, was a role model for, for me in that regard. For a shooter, for a entertainer, for unbelievable in his ability to deal with life. And so I, I celebrate that and I salute him today. Uh, we had a number of different things that, that we talked about. Uh, uh, let's see. Oh, we had the recording of Three Mile Island. It's a Bobby that going out to Three Mile Island. I was the assignment editor of Channel 3 that sent him out there. The one story I'll tell you about Susan, Three Mile Island. She knew about it. And they asked me to go. I ended up there for two weeks. But Susan's at the door. You're not going. 